thank you all for joining us today for another episode of Search From Home. Uh, I'm Stefan Bajau, your host, along with my co-host, Patrick Reinhardt, who happens to be here on my screen, and he's going to tell me here, like always. And today we are going to be getting into ADA compliance, uh, understanding it. It is a foreign topic for many of us. It should not be a foreign topic for many of us. Our good friend, Bauman from Zivic, who is the founder of the Zivic Agency out in L.A., is an expert, I would say. I think it's safe to say he's an expert uh, on ADA compliance and making companies uh, more compliant or fully compliant, we'll say, or on a rolling basis compliant. I know I just said or, 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 uh, in regards to how they can be better and serve more audiences. If you were with us for the uh, Perna conversation last week, Perna from Microsoft, we were talking about inclusivity of audiences and the need to be more inclusive in the way that we deal with audiences. Uh, this is a prime example of doing it, not to mention it's the law. So uh, thankfully we have our good friend Bauman here to kind of walk us through this and we'll be going back and forth throughout. Bauman, how are you? Good, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Conductor has always been a good supporter of web accessibility over the past few years. And uh, I think the partnership has really helped a number of brands. So thank you guys. And thanks for setting this up. I really appreciate it. Thanks. I promise I did not pay him to say that, but I appreciate the <laughs> comment none, and compliment nonetheless. So uh, Bauman, give us a little background on you and Zivic, just so people understand who you are, where you're coming from, and, and a little background. And also, how are things in LA? I mean, uh, we haven't spoken to that many people out in LA right now. So what's, uh, what's the world of COVID like in LA? I see a door that, or is that a door that might be open behind you? It looks sunny and, and it nice is sunny. out. That's like my dog run back there. Um, but uh, it is sunny and nice and beautiful. And I don't move away from this monitor much. <laughs> so. Yeah, I feel like I'm chained to mine. So I completely I know. understand. <laughs> I have a 15 month old, so I don't get to go out as much, but uh, the few times I go, the air is clean, it's nice, and uh, I think people are respecting the stay at home orders, so hopefully we'll get through this thing soon. Have you um, driven around? Is it like, uh, is it, I know LA is a, a driving city, so like I'm wondering whether or not there's, you've actually been on roads that normally should be 100% packed and now have no people on them or? Big, no, it's not like there's no people, but cars are not inching, so. Okay, I only uh, I only say that because it's like I am legend here in New York City at times. Yeah. So, you know, it is barren. Like I'm waiting for like weeds to come up through the, through Park Avenue, you know, yeah. and stuff. <laughs> No, it's not that scary, but uh, it de definitely you can feel the difference. Yeah, with everything closed and so on. But you know, we're lucky that we have the nice weather. I think that's gonna pay off a little bit here for the folks in LA. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and how about Zivic? Give us a little bit of background on you and how you kind of came to found Zivic and, and, and grow this company and a uh, sure. little background on, on that. Um, I went to University of Wisconsin-Madison back in the 90s. I was actually thinking about that today and I was one of the lucky people that when I started my computer science degree, the internet was pretty new. So kind of the early days of the internet, everything took like a minute to load on your page. <laughs> with your dial up. But uh, right after that, I ended up taking a job at the university for a few weeks and a opportunity came up three weeks into my first job and I kind of quit and started Zivic wow. to tackle that opportunity. And that was the start of the company and it's been going on for 20 plus years now. Um, I still stay very hands-on, uh, even though we have a good number of people on our team across the world. Uh, we have five offices now, and um, we do a lot of uh, enterprise platform builds and uh, organic growth alongside with that. So 
it's fun. I love problem solving and helping brands grow in whatever way we can. And this topic is definitely uh, an important one to me, which interestingly enough, uh, I got a lot of experience with web accessibility back in the day of working at the university. I used to work there as a student uh, while I was graduating as well. So, uh, and not a whole lot has changed uh since then so it's great to uh continue to be able to support uh those in need yeah i guess uh, why um why has web accessibility been something so near and dear to your heart because it seems like it's something that you've chosen to plant a flag in and a lot of companies have avoided it um yeah. whether they've done it on purpose or not is questionable but i think like a lot of people don't face web accessibility or they put it off as a we'll get to that, right? Yeah. Um, it tends to be the left behind aspect of, definitely of search, I'll say that. And yeah. then in general of building building sites, whereas you would think it should be like paramount. And mm -hmm. I think we'll talk about this legal actions and other things are starting to bring this much more to the forefront. So people are more more uh, at the executive level starting to focus more like as they should have been to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. um, but but how come, how come this has been a, a focus for you uh, in the way it has. And, and then let's get into web accessibility and what it really means. Sure, absolutely. Again, uh, since I started dealing with it uh, and truly feeling how there are students at the university that literally do not have access to the same level of material that I would be sitting next to them and have access to uh, was a big impact. Like I was seeing it uh, immediately there. And I had a couple of great mentors uh, who truly opened my eyes into uh, the web is there to be, you know, liberate everyone. You have access to all information, but then at the same time, we're excluding a now massive number of internet users. Um, so that was uh, kind of stayed with me until about five years ago where uh, this whole thing just blew up again and we'll get into that a little bit uh, as we speak but um, I think one of the biggest challenges that we're facing is lack of knowledge. Um, I'll give you a quick example uh, without naming names I was talking to a uh, top engineer for a very well-known CMS and he didn't know what ADA WCAG is. He was like, can you walk me through that? And I was like, how are you architecting a CMS that delivers all this content without the knowledge? Because we got to tackle this at the source. So we'll get into all this uh, a little bit more, but, uh, and why I was thanking Conductor because you guys have a great audience and, um, uh, you're truly helping to get the word out. And I think that's important. Making everyone aware will definitely help in uh, becoming more accessible to everyone. Great. So do you want to go ahead and share your screen and we'll, we'll put, we'll put some stuff up sure. or do you want to? Absolutely. All right. Um, as soon as I figure that out. Yeah, it should just be, there should be a screen share option at the bottom there for you. Yeah. Here we go. Whoops, not share, present. Okay, so uh, I kind of collected a number of uh, basic questions so that we can kind of go through them, better understand uh, what we're dealing with and the impact it has in our world. So uh, number one, what is web accessibility? Like I said, we people who are, who've dealt with it feel like everyone should know, but surprisingly, there's a large number of uh, people in the industry that don't know what web accessibility means, which is super simple. Web accessibility means making your digital presence as a brand uh, inclusive to everyone. And we'll get into what that inclusivity means, who we're trying to include and keep inclusive and uh, what to make available. 
Um, the next thing that really comes up is what is WCAG, which is basically the um, web uh, content accessibility guidelines, the acronym. And it's just basically a set of uh, principles that help us determine how to make our digital presence more accessible to the world. And there's tiers and levels to that, which basically means additional and enhanced principles. So if you go back, uh, and there's a number of different names for it, uh, Section 508, ADA, WCAG, all of these acronyms really go back to the set of principles that over the years have uh, continued to be optimized and overseen by W3C, the web consortium. And they're uh, basically a nonprofit organization that uh, is made up of a number of uh, high-end brands, uh, a lot of folks in education, higher ed, that have come together to put these principles together as to how to make the web more accessible. So um, before getting into much more technical details, uh, a big question that I get uh, time and again is that when we talk about WCAG or ADA compliance, um, a lot of times immediately uh, it comes to the mind of people that we're just dealing with uh, people that are blind. And uh, that's not the case. <laughs> there are so many different variation of abilities that will impact how we go about using the web that I think it's super important for us to be aware of that. And I put together uh, a few examples here so we can uh, kind of all become familiar with it. Number one, hard of hearing. So if you have any type of content, audio content, video that um, doesn't have proper captioning or transcript, these uh, people are going to have a hard time uh, consuming that content. Um, a lot of times I talk about hero banners. That's very common across the web. They're just like jumping around, moving too quickly. So if you have any visitor, site visitor with uh, ADHD, that uh, moving around flickering of content will basically uh, create a lot of challenges for them. And uh, that's why we always recommend putting the control in the hands of the user. So instead of as soon as I jump on a website, it starts doing all these crazy things, let them click the play button or at least give them a pause button to allow them to control what's going on. Is there, is there, Bob, and is there, because this was the first time I'd seen ADHD as one of the options. So uh, when I was looking at this before, Sure. Is there, and someone who struggles openly with, uh, with attention deficit disorder, myself, um, is there a speed at which people recommend like a hero banner? And when I think of hero banners often in that movement, right, I'm not thinking of the casino right. <laughs> crazy, <laughs> like, bah, bah, bah. you know, I'm thinking more like, okay, your typical experience might be there's three or four images that are going to scroll on a hero image. Right. How fast do they move? Uh, and yeah, a big arrow here and here allowing me to move from side to side. Right. Or the ability to stop them from moving. Right. Sure. Um, is there a, is there a speed that people recommend? So that's a great question. And again, one that we get quite a bit and it applies to everything. So going back think of it this way wcag is not a set of hard and fast rules of do it by three seconds or you know giving you the exact way of doing things they're principles so the principle okay. that relates to this says put the control in the hands of the user how that gets interpreted is really up to those that are making the digital presence compliant and why this becomes a little bit more complex and less mechanical and automated. 
as in if we had a hard and fast rule of make it five seconds, well, we could all build programs that could automatically detect and fix that issue. Unfortunately, that's not the case. And it really depends on the different levels of um, uh, compliance we're trying to achieve and who to make the content available to. So the great question, not a fixed answer to it. Got it. And so, but so if I, if I got you correctly, and I just want to make sure I did, sure. the different levels do have particular, I mean, in order to achieve a level, right, you have to do a certain amount of things in order for that to right. be the case, right? So are there metrics in those cases or is it just an on or off binary? Like I do or don't have alt text. I do or don't things that are like binary mm -hmm. as opposed to we could argue the speed at which a banner moves mm -hmm. is subject to, again, a, a rule, right? But, sure. but I don't know what that rule is versus having a banner that has something behind it. So a reader would be able to tell what's going on or having a banner that doesn't have any movement at all. Right. right. No movement or some movement sure. versus the time in which it takes to move. Great question. Doesn't apply to this case, but to give you an example. So we have the levels. There's WCAG 2.0, WCAG 2.1 now. And then within each of those, we have the levels of A, AA, AAA. Right. And the higher the number, the higher the level, it means that you are more strict in terms of how you're presenting your content. A very good example of that is using how to make a video, piece of video content accessible, where with uh, level A, as long as you have closed captioning, you're fine. Double A, you want to include the transcript along with that. Triple A, you want to have the um, sign language right next to it. Oh, so wow. okay. So it's, so it's levels of got someone. it. So the levels of accessibility literally are the levels of accessibility. You're just going through the process of it's usually additive, correct? Like exactly. it's not augmentative, it's additive. Like it's an additional aspect to it that now makes it even more uh, exactly. accessible. Exactly. Got it. Okay. Yeah. That, that makes sense. Interesting. Yeah. Sorry. Absolutely. So arthritis, that's, that's Great another question. one I was, yeah, this, this one, yeah, this one is, that's interesting. I never, I didn't even know that this, I never even happen. thought about, I mean, this makes me yeah. feel bad that I didn't think this way, but like yeah. concerning my, my parents have it, but like, <laughs> I never really thought about this, but this is a good point. Yeah. I mean, so again, this goes back to my early days and my mentors. And one of the things that I learned very early on was how to control everything with a keyboard as opposed to constantly moving your hand with the mouse, where in my case, I wanted to do things faster. In the case of someone who has arthritis, they may not be able to move the mouse around as much as we feel comfortable with it. So how can I maneuver around and browse and navigate with my keyboard, which is really the main means of getting through navigations using the tab and uh, shift tap, which goes forward and backward uh, within the site navigation. So that's a, a very important thing. And again, some of these challenges that I've put here uh, are just examples. So it's not just arthritis, it could be a number of other reasons that you do want to give that full keyboard access and support to the user. I, I just wanted to, the main point here is that we can't just think that it's blind people. They can't see the site. So as long as we read it out loud to them, then we're fine. That's mm -hmm. not the case. Um, the next one is an example of uh, stuttering and you know, if there's uh, any kind of uh, voice interaction on a web-based service, which is a growing uh, uh, feature and popularity across the board. This is super important. And then the last one, which is the most commonly known is visual disabilities, where we want to make sure that anything that is not text-based that can easily be read out using machines, then that uh, information has alternative text-based uh, content for it. Yeah, quick shout out to LinkedIn also. Was really impressed recently. I'm not sure if you've noticed this, Bauman, but 
when you post images on LinkedIn, they're actually offering you the idea of putting alt, uh, alt text to the images, which I thought was a very, I haven't seen that on other social platforms. I thought that was a very cool move on their part Mm -hmm. um, to try and make things more inclusive. Well, absolutely. That goes to the example of the CMS guy I was talking about. And it's the mm-hmm. same concept. If your content management system does not provide the functionality, then that's a challenge. How do, even if I wanted to make my content accessible, but my CMS doesn't allow for it, then that's a big problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Katie Greenwood just put in the chat also that Instagram has that as well. Which, oh, is, uh, okay. which is a great, great thing. So hopefully this is a movement we're seeing among social platforms to do it, not simply because it's the way it should be, or no, more because it's the way it should be, not just because it's a legal requirement in some cases, but yeah. just because, I mean, social of all things also is quite ubiquitous and something that a lot of people use irrespective of disability or not. So the ability to be able to engage socially with their friends and others and professionally as many do on LinkedIn, I think it's fundamental that those things exist. So I'm glad they do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so great. Um, the next topic I thought would be interesting for us is um, has COVID-19 impacted uh, compliance requirements? Um, a lot of brands, uh, unfortunately, have had to be uh, sued and get into legal trouble in order to kind of become aware and want to uh, make the move to become compliant. And uh, they may be thinking, well, great, now that this whole thing is going on, no one's paying attention. But that, that's super important. I mean, right now, look at all these... Um, uh, programs where the governors and uh, government officials are kind of giving the notices. I'm sure you guys have seen some of them have uh, a person next to them with uh, sign language. And that just says how many people are out there that do need these uh, the extra attention. And um, the reality is that this has become much more important. And I've listed some of the reasonings. Obviously, the lawsuits, which uh, towards the end of 2019 was close to one every hour, has not only not gone down in 2020 and through the uh, COVID-19 days, but it's actually gone up. Um, So definitely uh, that part of it has not changed. So Bauman, who brings, who brings these lawsuits? Is this like, um, uh, anti def No, well, I don't know if it's anti-defamation league. It'd be more like, is it individuals? Is it, uh, organizations on behalf of like that are out there looking for these things? That's a lot. I would say one every hour is a, a staggering number in my mind. Yeah. Right. So is it that actively people are looking to set the record straight and make sure as almost proponents here that people are following the law? I wish that was the case. Um, I think organizations that are responsible are uh, very limited in terms of um, their funds and ability to kind of grow this out there. The unfortunate part of it is that there's attorneys that are benefiting from this. Um, they have gotten wind of how easily they can test a digital presence, a website, an app, and so on to see if it's not compliant. And they're the ones that are mostly taking legal action. Um, and, uh, but that's, that's a fair number of the legal cases, but out there, there's the organizations that you mentioned, and there's individuals that truly can't access certain things that they should be online. And uh, that's what's uh, causing this. It's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. I mean, I guess it kind of sucks to a degree, right? It's like, there are people who are taking advantage of the situation, which obviously you need to be aware of the fact there are people out there. I hate to say trolling, but essentially, um, looking like m- much like patent law, right. And, and yeah. treating this as a, a financial opportunity. Yeah. Um, the double-edged sword to that is obviously the more accessible the web becomes, the better off, uh, everyone is ultimately. Yeah. So it ends up being a good case in the end. 
Um, and nonetheless, people should be paying attention to this. It's just, I, I, until I saw this stat, I had no idea that it was one an hour. I guess that's a very large number yeah. in my mind of lawsuits yeah. being brought uh, around this type of thing. Yeah, and it's impacting everyone. I mean, when I said five years ago, it started blowing back up. Five years ago, it was our billion dollar business clients that were getting sued. Today, we get calls from the mom and pop pizza shop or cookie shop that's being sued. And they're like, mm -hmm. I can't afford to go through this. Maybe I should just shut down my website, which is mm -hmm. unfortunate. Wow. Yeah. Um, and hopefully with these big movements, uh, there's better solutions out there uh, that will help. Um, Obviously, the other thing as it relates to COVID-19 is that businesses that are moving online um, are, we're, we don't deal with a lot of small businesses, but literally we're getting 20, 30 phone calls a day that it's a business that needs to move online and for whatever, if it's e-commerce or they just want to have some sort of a presence and access is just blowing up. So more and more businesses are going online, which means people who would access these businesses offline and maybe with some other uh, direct support no longer have that. So we want to make sure that we're making these uh, platforms available to everyone um with again workforce being down the direct support uh has been down for uh people with uh, a variety of abilities so that is important uh, another reason to make it available a lot of uh schools universities are jumping on uh moving to online uh learning management systems that may not even be accessible um mm -hmm. we had to work with the university just recently and um that was one of the key factors we were looking at when we were doing the audit of lms's out there to see which ones are accessible and surprisingly not all of them are so um that's a challenge um so so bomb in one second is there we talked about the levels briefly do the <laughs> do is there a certain like threshold so if you're a or double a that mm -hmm. tends to be i hate to say good enough but like essentially has been covered in terms of like i i, I like to think this uh, about this also as like liability insurance every business sure. needs to have it right Absolutely. and so um it should be like i said ubiquitous and something everybody has mm -hmm. so you can have different degrees of that, right? And right. and depending on the risk that your business might have, someone can walk in and trip on a slip on a grape in a grocery store. Yeah, you need to obviously have, but then there are places where the odds of that happening are very slim to none, so you don't have to take out as much. I guess yeah. the question is, is it, does it hold the same in the way that you think of the tiers? And like, does the mom and pop pizza shop have to go to the extreme and have <laughs> like sign language on their videos, which I don't mean that in any negative yeah. way. I'm just saying the amount of work that goes into that for a business that isn't primarily online mm -hmm. versus a billion dollar business that's not doing that. There's those are definitely different shades of, of the same color. You know what I mean? Right, right. I think uh, that's a very good point, by the way. I never thought of it as like if you're a bigger business, you should invest more um i'll think more about that um but i think uh it's uh how much coverage you get right and the most common has been wcag 2.0 a for the past three years but i'm seeing a lot of brands that can afford it start moving into 2.1 a which has an additional i want to say 17 criteria uh, has big impact on the mobile users, uh, which uh, gives you a lot more controls on a mobile device. So it's definitely great to uh, be able to do the 2.1, but 2.0 AA continues to be the most common uh, used across. Yeah, it's surprising that especially the, well, I guess, you know, the learning, uh, the LMS systems are, well, I guess LMS, his system at the end. But anyway, uh, you know, these learning management systems, I'm surprised that they haven't thought 
through that in advance. I guess now yeah. they're probably overwhelmed with demand. So the idea of using their resources against that is probably not their top priority, though it really should be because what it is is opening them up to a much larger audience. And because they're being open to a much larger audience, it creates this liability that they're mm -hmm. opening themselves up to, right? Mm -hmm. In doing that. So uh, you're not allowed absolutely. to grow at the pace yeah. that they're growing and then not also take the risk that comes along with that. <clears throat> Oh, absolutely. And I guess let's clarify that learning management systems get used in different industries. Those that are the bigger ones been around long enough to be used in higher ed schools. Those were required to be compliant back when I started 20 some years ago. So and that's how I learned about it. Um, it's the ones that are uh, nowadays popping up for corporations. If you wanna have some uh, learning material uh, online for your employees, those are the ones that didn't really think of this as a requirement. And it's unfortunate that now they're getting used across the board for a variety of reasons and they may not be compliant. So that's definitely important. Um, healthcare, big, big challenge now. Um, again, a lot of treatment has immediately moved online. The HIPAA rules are relaxed now, but you know, we're using all these different means because we want to help the majority, but then you got to think inclusive and that's important. So telemedicine, like the up, the, the up version of telemedicine and how that's coming to I mean, you can exactly. see that wave coming, right? There's no question oh, yeah. telemedicine is here to stay in my mind. It's yeah. going to be a thing. There really is no reason to go to the doctor's office for many different things that you could probably be done virtually. But then that ease, which you would think for people who have a potential disability mm -hmm. uh, would be really beneficial, first and foremost, to them in not having to undertake uh you know, going to the doctor's office or things that are unnecessary, um, you would think that that would be paramount and that that would be thought of that way. But exactly. essentially, is that where you're getting at with the medical treatment kind of things? Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, a lot of interactions have moved online. Uh, so super important. I want to order medicine. I want to be aware of my deliveries, all these different things uh, that may have been something that you do in person may not even be available as an in person solution. So definitely important. Uh, work from home accommodations, uh, we're all working from home, but again, those with the variety of abilities, can they uh, be working from home with the same level of comfort that you and I have with mm -hmm. what's available to us? So again, uh, another impact of COVID-19 that we may have not thought about, like if you can't get it done from home, stay in the office and get it done. Now that's not an option. So how do we make that available? And then the last one, obviously retail and restaurants, which are hit so hard and are now desperate to kind of make alternative solutions available is uh, one that again people are going to be utilizing those uh, online solutions is it all inclusive so COVID-19 has hurt all of us in many ways um, but here we're looking at it and we want to make sure that we're definitely staying inclusive uh, across the board um, so I guess, um, the next thing I wanted to kind of talk through is some of the business cases, uh, to become compliant. And this is super important. These numbers, some people don't even think about, and I included the links here, um, which we can look at over a billion people live with some form of disability across the world. That's 15% of the population. That's massive. Um, one in four adults uh, in the United States uh, have some sort of disability that impacts their life. Um, I remember uh, Pruna last week was talking about one in five 
with uh, sort of disabilities that impact online and uh, I trust her numbers. This is not necessarily just online access, but it's a massive number. And 217 million people worldwide with uh, severe vision impairment. That's just the one point that a lot of people think of when they're thinking about uh, accessibility and that alone is such a big number for us to kind of consider. Um, so this next set of uh, items is really how uh, this is, this could be a really big positive thing for brands to take into consideration and not just kind of think about the legal aspect of it. And if I don't do it, I'm going to get sued. Um, you can definitely be a better brand, um, enhance your brand, be socially responsible, be inclusive. Uh, for sure, it's an important aspect uh, for a lot of big brands. Um, the next one is really extending the market reach as the numbers we looked at in the last slide. Um, we're dealing with a massive number of people which now more so than ever before rely on online interaction. So you don't want to miss out on that. That's great business case. Um, hey, Bauman, just a yes. quick question about the sure. enhance your brand because I just thought about this yeah. just kind of shot into my head is there a is there a, a a and forgive my ignorance on this is there a logo or a uh, an organization that yeah. ultimately like um, these brands can actually say much like there are for diversity hiring or there are for other aspects of um, doing the right thing, what we know is the right thing, but ultimately like having third party validation that you've done the right thing seems to be unfortunately one of the impetuses for people to do the right thing, or at least it comes along with doing the right thing. So it's like right. you in fact are doing the right thing. Is there something that websites actually can post for all of us to know that they are doing this? Cause you wouldn't necessarily um, know that if you're not going through that experience or lack that experience of the website. Right. Um, is there something that they do to say we are in fact compliant at this level? That is, that is a great question. Um, so compliance is a, uh, at a certain period of time, are you compliant or not? Because two minutes later, you could be adding some content to your site that makes it non-compliant. And again, having the unfortunate aspect of this being in the hands of some attorneys that may not have the best of intentions, that becomes a bigger challenge. So, and um, there is no such thing as a certificate of compliance. Uh, there is validation of compliance. There's certain tools that validate and say at this time we've reviewed your site and your X percentage compliant. Here are the issues. Uh, some, I've seen some government sites do that. Um, but what I see a lot of social, socially responsible brands do is to include a web accessibility notice on their site. Their level of commitment to it, the fact that they're trying to do more and make their presence uh, available, that's what I've seen a lot of. Um, and I think that's, that's pretty good for now. Uh, I'm sure a badge of some sort will come up soon. <laughs> sure. I guess it would also open you up to, yeah. to your point. It would open you up to legal action if you were stating something and then others. Yeah. Were, it's, it's, it's such a catch 22 in that respect. And it really frustrates me because it's like you do the right thing, but to your point, there's a certain level of governance. If people can't even govern their SEO properly, which can sometimes <laughs> exactly. be as simple as like, hey, can you just make sure the title tags don't have some wonky ass stuff in them? And that's a very simple, you know, like, well, and there are levels of sophistication, let's be honest, in all of this, right? Like an yeah. image could go out with an alt text image aspect to it every single time you put out an image. You really could do that. And I know that's the most rudimentary thing. Right. I don't want to make this seem simplistic, but like yeah. that alone should be just standard governance in web publishing. Right. Which is again, yeah, where, where I go back to the CMS, like you're the, you guys are the ones that are controlling how content gets published. You should be responsible for making that happen. And 
alert the user, you don't have proper alt tag or whatnot. Some of this stuff is super basic. And, um, I and it's a, a selling proposition for the CMS. If the CMS can say, we give you the ability to be more compliant, um, we will alert you to the fact that you are not along the way if certain things aren't followed. To me, that almost is a selling proposition for them. You'd think they would get on board that right away because it's a feature functionality that doesn't, I would hope, doesn't cost them a lot in engineering, but could be lot. great sales fodder for them. That doesn't make any sense to me. Absolutely. 100% agreed. Um, the third one I listed here is minimize your legal risk. I think that's the one that stands out the most, but it is what it is. And one that uh, I've heard less about, and I think it's super important, is that there's a lot of overlap be between uh, accessibility, compliance, and SEO. And to kind of step out and look at it from the outside, basically, SEO, you're optimizing for search engines. These are basically machines that are reading through your content. That is no different than the machine that is going through your content and presenting that information in a way that is uh, accessible to the user with a variety of abilities. So the concept is the same. And there's so much overlap that if you are making your digital presence compliant, then automatically you're increasing your uh, search engine uh, ranking. And to look at some of those examples, uh, for example, the alt text is a super simple one, um, heading tags, title tags. These are things that would improve your SEO. If you do your compliance, it's gonna help both uh, sides of the matter. Yeah, one so, that's often overlooked that I kind of personally like a lot is the file name. So yeah. I, I tend to think people don't name their files. Uh, you think you name your files based on a designer who's just, just, I shouldn't say just, but who's not focused whatsoever on the naming convention of the file yeah. aside from being able to find the file, call to the file and use the file. Yep. But in reality, what the file actually exemplifies without getting into a long, long, you know, file name uh, can sometimes be beneficial for everyone, right? The yep. search engine, the user, as well as, uh, as well as readers and other things. 100%. So definitely important. These are some business cases that if the other numbers haven't convinced you yet, these should. Um, and how do we take advantage of this time now and not sit around and worry? There's uh, five things you can consider in making your digital presence accessible. Uh, planning obviously is super important as uh, probably you've noticed through this conversation it, it's not a simple task there's a lot to interpret from the guidelines it's not hard and fast rules so it's important to plan out and determine is this something you want to do in-house are you a big enough of a brand to uh, have someone who is responsible for your compliance uh, or is it something you want to outsource and if you opt to outsource what are the things you want to look out for uh, when you're going through that process uh, when you do that you want to look at the complexity of your platform do you have a uh, simple catalog site or is it a enterprise e-commerce site or enterprise application uh, big big difference in terms of what you're doing there and how you're making things available um, the type of the content you have on your site you mentioned files it's kind of like pdfs obviously pdf files get read through and scanned so you want to make sure your pdfs are compliant one of the things that is uh, overlooked is third party uh solutions so if you're making your site compliant and you're linking out to another website that is a requirement of accomplishing business for a visitor that comes to your site that third party site needs to be compliant. So for example, if you come to my site, you pick a product, 
but then you check out on a different site, that site's got to be compliant. Otherwise, I've gone through half of it. And then as soon as I link out to go through that checkout, I miss out. So an example, and I don't know if this would fly one way or another. I'll throw, I'll throw a tough one at you, okay? And okay. you can tell me I'm a schmuck for doing that live on the show. Um, sure. So like a job board, for example, right? A job board, um, a job yeah. board, you find the job on the job board, right? But you don't apply for the job on the job board. So then exactly. is that idea that you've left the job board, it's not their problem anymore? Or is it like, no, hold on a second, because their applicant tracking system is not compliant, yeah. which you would hope, by the way, you would really hope that applicant tracking systems would get smart about this because you're literally in, in, in hiring practices, you're not allowed yeah. <laughs> by law to discriminate. And here, like this would be essentially a form of discrimination and not yep. being able to um, have access to those jobs. 100%. That is, in fact, one of the things that uh, some of these massive clients of ours were getting sued for five years ago, that um, you're pulling the job listing through these uh, third parties, you're presenting it on your site, your site is compliant. As soon as I click out to go out there to apply for it, nothing works and definitely a great example i wasn't even thinking of that so great question cool no that that and Absolutely. i would assume also forms yeah. so I, I i tend to immediately go to mm -hmm. https and mm -hmm. think about like where sections of your site might not be secure because they're third party relevant and yeah. that ties my brain immediately to okay well are those also compliant in that way because if they're not like it's fine to take someone through an entire process but then you get them to a form and that form is run by a third party maybe in an iframe or something on your site but it's still considered part of your process so you are still not compliant if they're not compliant which is something exactly. i've never even thought about until this call yeah, very important. A site we went through just recently had 70 plus uh, sites that they relied on to accomplish business. And surprisingly, none of them were compliant. Um, wow. <laughs> wow, that's scary. I, I mean, it's scary, scary also to think scary. about. It's scary because I don't know how many people are thinking about how many sites they rely yeah. on in yeah. order to do business. I think it's like they buy a product and they're like, oh, that's taken care of. And then like that doesn't become, uh, so, so I guess follow-up question, Bauman, who does that fall under in the company? Because that's not the SEO's job per se, right? We have, right. we play one small role in this. Mm -hmm. Are we dealing with like the CIO, the CTO, who's supposed to wrangle or herd those mm -hmm. cats and say, yeah. Ooh, this is a problem because I'm sure those products were bought and those services and partnerships were made by many people who are not in the know. Right. Yeah. And then that wasn't like part of their, that wasn't part of their uh, procurement. I would assume procurement should know about these things, but doesn't necessarily yeah. ask those questions. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I guess where does the buck stop is kind of what I'm getting. Right. You would be shocked as to who I'm about to name. And it's the CFOs that I've dealt with the most over the past years. Um, reason being is that this typically becomes, uh, they're, they're notified through legal. Mm -hmm. And it's the CFO that comes in immediately. And almost, I want to say 80, 90% of cases I've dealt with over the past five years, it's been CFOs I've dealt with, which is not the best. They're not technical. They don't know what's going on. So who should really be dealing with this is who owns the online presence whether that is the CIO, CTO, marketing manager, whoever that is, who's responsible for the brand, who's responsible for the online presence, those are the people that really need to be responsible for this. And why I feel like education is so important because uh, in a lot of cases that I deal with, they immediately go online, they try to search, what is WCAG? What do I need to do? And there's so much misinformation out there. There's like uh, minimal solutions that they feel like, okay, great. I'm going to get this done and be done with it. And it really doesn't solve the problem. Um, so I feel like proper education is the most important thing at this point. It feels like, and it feels like there should be a, 
more proactive governing body where they're actually optimizing to be found for mm -hmm. the answers to these types of things because it feels right. like it feels like uh you know in every single one of these cases right when, when you think about the the challenge you've kind of thrown out at us and i, I know we have about like nine more minutes but yeah. um it's like you can be compliant but you can be compliant for only one moment in time potentially right so if right. someone finds you non-compliant there's more time they can find you non-compliant than they can find you compliant okay right unless you build governance in place and then on top of that you have the people who are usually dealing with the issue of non-compliance are probably and no offense to any cfo friends of mine the lesser technical folks because that's not their job traditionally but it is their job to deal with legal, legal ramifications in a company so they get rolled into the situation but they're not necessarily the people who are responsible for it. so it's it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy that this will hit your business because yeah. The people who should be aware are not aware when the people who are not aware and sh should also be aware, but like the CFOs go searching, they're not finding the answers they need, right? To help them understand the problem better. Exactly. And then there's no like, there's no sense of, of, of uh, I guess, of, of need across the org to match this. But yet if you were to go to physical locations, right? It's really weird because if you were to go into some of those stores, right? If they only had stairs going in, they didn't have an elevator going to the second floor. They didn't. All of these people would be deemed like mm -hmm. by by building codes to yeah. be uncompliant, right? Yeah. In the physical space, in the brick space, but exactly. in the click space, it's because I guess the the building keeps changing yeah. um, every every minute, right? Yeah. Um, the, there's a there's a weird kind of like hot potato game with this thing? Yeah. Is that fair to say? It is. And uh, I remember presenting with Katie, who was on this uh, webinar uh, last year. And one of the things that we had thought of uh, coming up is uh, maybe search engines would be a good governance, the same way that Google indicates if your site is not secure. Sure. Uh, and search results, maybe they could be responsible for presenting that the site is not accessible. That would be really, that would be really, yeah. that's a great point. I mean, I think that would be really great on their behalf as a, as a, as a movement to help, yeah. you know, put that in webmaster tools. I mean, search console, you know, put that, uh, those warnings there, um, you know, yeah. uh, yeah. But I guess they also can be worried that they take on the liability then of, <laughs> man, exactly. we are so litigious in this country that like you, you kind of, it's like, like I said, it's a double-edged sword, right? You, yeah. you try to do what's right and then you try to make people do what's right. And then unless they get like hit in the wallet, they don't do what's right. It's very frustrating, I'm sure. It is, it is. And uh, just to be fair, there's a lot of uh, on, uh, online monitoring tools, platforms Mm -hmm. uh, we've built our own at Zivic that basically it's like a crawler, like deep crawl. It goes through your site and it identifies uh, lack of accessibility. What is important is that these online crawlers will only detect about 40 to 50% of the issues, right. technical issues. Like I mentioned, there's a lot of things that technical machines cannot capture and that's where the expert manual audit comes into play and really helps there's nothing for apps that automatically scans an app and that is one piece that a lot of people are forgetting about as we're not just talking about your website any native app you have needs to be compliant as well um, actually, phone devices have great uh, screen readers at this point built in. So if your app is compliant, it'll work out of the box and you don't need any third party tools. Hmm. Um, hmm. So some things to consider. This is a great time. Some of us have a little bit more downtime. So uh, spending time going through these things and seeing where you can improve your site is definitely helpful. Um, and there's help out there for it, which I kind of uh, listed out. What are some ways to reduce the cost of compliance? Um, take advantage of your team. Right now, if somebody's uh, not doing much, then get them trained and add alt tags, for example. Um, definitely something that the basics can be remedied and 
you can take advantage of your team. Definitely have a plan. And there's two tax incentives, very different from the small business loans that no one seems to be able to get. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> but there's these tax incentives that definitely uh, are available to businesses that do try to become compliant. And I'll let you guys distribute this. Yeah, we'll definitely, uh, I'll, yeah. I'll put this as a file in the, uh, in the LinkedIn group. Guys, if you haven't checked out the LinkedIn group for Search From Home, by all means, join. Um, yeah. That is where we try to continue the conversations uh, as well as put up things that happen during the meetings that we want to share with folks. So we'll be sure to actually distribute this there if you don't mind bombing. Yeah, um, absolutely. We'll put that up as a file. And uh, yeah, if we want to get into the last point, uh, A11Y, what does it mean? And that's literally a uh, numeronym, like an acronym for accessibility. So if you see it, uh, that's what that means. Yeah. And um, I thought that's a fun fact for people to be aware of. Yeah, I didn't know about numeronyms. So like, I uh, didn't either. <laughs> I'm like, do I get to put my name as a numeronym? Like, <laughs> I, I also was like, is there a numeronym generator? Because this could be a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. So, um, Bauman, thank you so much for joining us today. I, I really appreciate it. I think this was fascinating. I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated. I'm uh, really like this. There's so much to this that we don't know as marketers that I think is. Uh, frankly shameful and I feel I feel elated and bad at the same time I feel bad because I didn't know so much of this coming in um, I feel elated because now I feel like at least I can be cognizant of it I can think through it I can look at these things and question what specific aspects are being followed I know there is a lot mm -hmm. more to this yeah. so uh, I would uh, highly recommend if you guys have additional questions by all means reach out to bomb and we'll make sure He's in the LinkedIn group and uh, you should hit him up with any questions you have about accessibility. He is, like I said, the expert when it comes to this oh, stuff, you. rightfully so. He spent years of doing this. Um, appreciate you all joining us today, Bauman. Thank you so much for all the insights. Uh, tomorrow we will have our uh, uh, good friend, Simon Hesseltine, who has been uh, head of search at AOL, head of search at Huffington Post, head of search at so many places come in to tell us uh, the horror stories, the fun mishaps, the problematic issues that he has seen. Names of the not so innocent will be kept uh, secretive, but he will be sharing amazing stories of people screwing up search and uh, what we can learn from those failures. So it's gonna be a lot of fun. I've seen him present something similar at Advanced Search Summit. It was phenomenal. I highly recommend you all join us tomorrow. Same time, same place. Uh, so 12 p.m. Eastern Standard. Uh, in the meantime, as we always say, uh, stay home, stay safe, stay connected, and we will see you all tomorrow. Thanks again, Bauman. Have a Thank great you. one, guys. Thanks. Take care.